Welcome everyone. My name is Katherine Bryla. I am the president of Sag Moraine Native Plant Community. I am joined tonight by Vice President Mary Gelder, who will be sharing questions later. Also on our team is Evelyn Miller, Donna, Amanda, and Kristen McCash. They'll all be busy behind the scenes taking all of your questions in the Q&A. We are excited and honored to be celebrating the official launch of Sag Moraine with a presentation by the one and only Doug Tallamy. I will be giving you a brief introduction to our organization before I hand it over to Doug. After his presentation, Doug will be answering questions. Please post your questions in the Q&A section. At the end of our program tonight, I will be answering any questions that you have about SAG Moraine. Please put those questions in the Q&A as well. The mission of SAG Moraine is to advocate for the use of native plants in residential, commercial, mm -hmm. and public landscapes. We believe that native plants are the foundation of our food chain and must become more widely utilized to improve the ecosystems that sustain life. We strive to provide a fun, friendly, and welcoming environment for all who share our commitment to restoring native plants to our community. The problem of global warming has gotten much press over the years and has thankfully become something that most Americans want to help control. However, the equally disturbing problem of pollinator and insect loss has gotten comparably little attention. This affects the future of our food supply. A main solution is to get more native plants back in our environment. We need landowners on board to make this work. After hearing Doug's presentation tonight, I am sure you will understand the importance of the Sag Moraine mission. Sag Moraine is a membership-based <clears throat> educational, social, and community outreach organization. We will educate about native plants and ecological gardening. We will provide information about plant selection and assistance with obtaining plants. Right now, this will be done remotely through Zoom meetings and webinars, blogs, and social media. Please visit our website, Facebook, and Instagram regularly. Hopefully one day soon, we will be able to make some of our education opportunities in person. As a social group, we will be planning social activities and group nature outings when the time is appropriate. In the meantime, please check out our Facebook group to share and connect with others. SAG Moraine will be reaching out to the community to spread the word about the importance of restoring native plants to our landscapes. We will also sponsor garden projects throughout the community and promote Doug Tallamy's homegrown national park movement. The goal of this call to action is to get 20 million acres of native plantings in the US. Once we commit to plant native, we can get on their interactive map to view our progress toward the 20 million acres. There is a link in the chat to learn more about homegrown national park. We also plan to support the Illinois Monarch Project. You will find their link in the chat as well. We are a nonprofit, all volunteer organization. Our 501c3 status is pending and should be complete in the next few weeks. All our work is funded by donations, future plant sales, and our yearly membership fee of $25 per person and $40 per family. We are never political. This is not about politics. It is about being aware of a problem that affects all of us and learning what we as individuals can do to help. The power to solve this problem is in the hands of landowners, not government. Please consider becoming a member of SAG Moraine. Help us spread the word, restore native plants, and help our ecosystem. You will find a link in the chat to become a member. If you do become a member, we will send you the Zoom link to our first online members meeting to be held on Wednesday, February 10th at 7 p.m. We will be further discussing our plans for 2021 and would appreciate your input and ideas. We will also have a very special guest, Kelsey from Possibility Place Native Plant Nursery in Moni, Illinois, will share some of his knowledge of native, native plants for our area. We will also be sharing the special partnership between Sag Moraine and Possibility Place. This partnership will allow all people in our community to purchase native plants from Possibility Place through a link on the Sag Moraine website, Facebook, and other platforms. They will be conveniently shipped right to your front door directly from Possibility Place. 
and part of the proceeds will go to support the work of SAG Moraine. We are thrilled to have such an amazing partner and resource. Watch our website and Facebook page for more information about this in the upcoming weeks. We will be ready to roll for the spring planting season. Once again, we will be answering any questions you have about SAG Moraine after tonight's presentation and Q&A with Doug Tallamy. I would now like to introduce our much anticipated speaker, Dr. Douglas Tallamy. He is a very popular speaker and the response to this webinar has been amazing. Doug is a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. He is an awarded researcher and New York Times bestselling author. Dr. Tallamy's books, Bringing Nature Home, The Living Landscape, and Nature's Best Hope are the foundation of a grassroots movement spreading across the country. He is changing the way people everywhere view the role of their private landscapes. Ladies and gentlemen, Doug Tallamy. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, it's a real honor to be part of the SAG Marine's debut, and I'm sure it's going to be successful. Uh, come on, there we go. All right, we're all screen shared here. Um, so thanks for coming tonight. I want to tell you about my idea for uh, what nature's best hope is, but before I do that, I want to return to what happened, um, not this past fall, but the year before fall. Um, I'm not sure it happened in Illinois. I think so. But uh, up and down the East Coast, anyway, we had what we call an oak mast. Um, members of the red oak group got together and all decided to produce their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those, those acorns and I just stared at it. But I was rewarded. An insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a little hole and forced its head through and then squeezed its body through that little hole, kind of looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy, finally plopped down. Very dangerous time for this insect larva because it is good to eat. Lots of things want to get at it. So it's got to get to, to safety below ground. And it does that by squirming under the soil, it takes about 30 seconds and down it goes, where it stretches in all different directions and makes a chamber. And inside that chamber, it converts itself to a pupa and then stays there for two years. After two years, comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think that's a big nose, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule. And the mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. And they use the mouth parts to chew a hole down into the center of the acorn. The female turns around, lays an egg in that hole, and that's how the larva gets down into the center of the acorn. And you might wonder why they spend two years underground. Why don't they come out the very next year? Well, it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, uh, there wouldn't be any acorns. Well, that leaves a hole, a true vacuum. And you know, nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of Timnothorax ants, tiny little ants that like to live in the vacated holes made by acorn weevils in acorns. And if they discover a new hole, their old acorns falling apart. So they want to move their colony into this, this new acorn. And they all get excited, work very hard. It takes about 30 minutes for them to move in. And once they do, they post a guard at the entrance here and make sure nobody else comes in. And they will live in this new acorn for the next two years. Well, about this time, I, my wife asked me, what is my point? What are you trying to tell us? I'm trying to tell you that that's just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions among the individuals of, of our ecosystems in, in nature. And this is another one, the relationship between uh, jays, actually jays all over the world and oaks. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. <clears throat> um, you know, the other day I found out what pollinates witch hazel. You can read that it's, it's flies and, and uh, sierrid fungus gnats, <clears throat> excuse me, but I never see any on there. Uh, well, it turns out actually that there are a group of moths that fly late in the season, well after the first frost, called winter moths. This is the bicolored sallow. I actually caught some bicolored sallows on Christmas Eve here, and there was snow on the ground. So that's how late they fly. And of course, witch hazel blooms very late. Uh, and uh, it turns out they're probably the primary pollinators of, of witch hazel. So whether witch hazel is blooming late to take advantage of these late flying moths, or the moths are flying late to take advantage of witch hazel, uh, I'll never know. But um, at this point, they both rely on each other. 
you won't have breeding pileated woodpeckers anywhere near you if you don't have lots of carpenter ants because that is what the uh, parents feed their young. And you're not going to have carpenter ants unless you have the large trees that make those carpenter ants. You're not going to have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have facilia. That's the only pollen that that species of bee can rear its young on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees and over a third of them are highly specialized, usually on one genus of plants. Uh, so for example, in, in the upper Midwest, there are at least 13 species of, of native bees that can only reproduce on the pollen of perennial sunflowers. You won't have Baltimore checker spot unless you have white turtle head. I could go on all night long talking about these specialized relationships. The problem though today is that these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, he looked out over the edge and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. The problem today though, is that leaving the country as it was is no longer an option um, because we haven't done that. There's only about 5% of the lower 48 states that's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And that's because we've logged the, the country repeatedly. We've, we've tilled it for sure. We've drained it. We've grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland in this country, which is four and a half times the size of Texas. And of course, we paved it or otherwise developed it. We've straightened our rivers and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We've polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers and introduced more than 3,500 species of, of uh, plants from other continents, many of which have escaped and, and are wreaking havoc in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up the natural world, the tiny remnants of its former self. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated from other remnants to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. Why have we done that? Not sure, but I guess we figured the earth was so large, our nest was so large, we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course, we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing headlines like this. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America's lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North American bird population gone. And now the UN predicts that uh, we, we very well might lose 1 million species to extinction. And it might be as soon as the, the next 20 years. And I love the way they report this um, as if it's just another headline. They might as well say we're going to lose oxygen in the next 20 years and then go on to the next headline as if it doesn't matter. This is not an option, folks. Living, losing a million species is not an option. It is time to act. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have, have delivered upon the environment and thus upon all of our houses but that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that, that will take small efforts from uh, many people, but they will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Uh, well, E.O. Wilson, the great, uh, great biologist, entomologist from Harvard, E.O. Wilson told us what it would mean if we were to lose insects and he did it way back in 1987 in this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. And his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, um, that would change, not only change the physical structure of, of terrestrial Earth, it would pretty much end energy flow through these terrestrial habitats, which would cause the rapid collapse of the food webs that support our animals, our amphibians, our reptiles, birds, mammals, and even many of our freshwater fish would all disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that, that rapidly turn over nutrients. And all we would have is, is bacteria and fungi. Of course, humans would not survive any of those drastic changes. The good news is that doesn't have to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself and thus ourselves, but we're gonna to have to change the way we landscape in order to do that. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on nature. We're dependent, I mean, we put a name on it, we call it ecosystem services, but um, these are the things that keep us alive and they all come from nature. What do, I, what do plants do for us? We talk about ecosystem services as, as serving humans, but it serves other living things as well. How about the production of oxygen? Everything needs that. Clean water, carbon capture, very important these days. 
Plants are capturing carbon by pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, locking it up in their tissues, and then pumping the extra into the ground. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots have deposited in the ground over the eons. Plants build topsoil, they hold it in place, they prevent floods, they dampen severe weather, all these important things. What do animals do for plants? Well, they provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds and many other things. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is simply not an option. It never was a good option, but today it's a terrible option. We've got 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet. We need more ecosystem services today than ever before. There were visionaries through the ages who recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with, with planet Earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent, you know, wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said was, the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Now, there have been some indigenous groups that have been good at doing that over time, but you know, our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We take more from the earth than it has to offer, totally spoiling an area. Then we move to another area and spoil that. Uh, and of course, that is not sustainable. Well, Aldo, Aldo recognized that and he had a dream that we would actually be able to develop what he called a land ethic. And he wrote about that in the Sand County Almanac. In his dream, we would learn to, to use the earth, farm it and lumber it and graze and do all the things we needed to do. But we would learn to do it gently, doing it without destroying local ecosystem services. And that would be his land ethic. What he didn't write about uh, that I know of was talking about developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, uh, but I suspect it was because the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist same time in the same place. That notion was so deeply embedded in the, the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, it's still embedded in our own day. He may not have recognized it as an option. Well, tonight I want to argue that, that living with nature not only is an option, it now is the only viable option that is left to us. Of course, in the past, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now have to turn that on its head we have to save, reconstruct nature where there are a lot of people because that's most of the planet. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes. Thrive, not just exist, but thrive in human dominated landscapes. Where should we start? Well, one thing we can't do is ignore private property because most of the country is privately owned. 85.6% of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we ignored private property, we'd only be working on 15% of the land, not nearly enough to accomplish our goal. But there were also lots of, of uh, both public and private properties that we don't consider as options for conservation centers. How about power and pipeline rights of ways? We've got 21 million acres in those types of landscapes, 300,000 kilometers of power line rights of ways. Big opportunity there. Railroad rights of ways, 3 million acres. Roadside, 17 million acres. Golf courses, 2 million acres. Airports, 3 million acres. You know, the, the Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. These are big places. Then we have all the places we live, both in, in rural areas and suburbia, our cities, hundreds of millions of acres in those sites. If you add up just those, and you can think of others, that's 599 million acres. How big is 599 million acres? Well, it's bigger than Vermont, plus New Jersey, plus Maine, Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Montana, plus California, throw Texas in there too. Not having a place to do conservation is not the issue. There are lots of places we can do it. So when I'm talking about conservation, I'm really talking about um, a form of restoration. We're not trying to recreate exactly what was where we are now uh, four or 500 years ago. That probably is impossible at this point. What we wanna do though is reassemble as many of those specialized relationships that are nature so that we have a functioning ecosystem may not be exactly what was there beforehand, but it doesn't matter. It can still be a functioning ecosystem. But to do that, we have to start with the most powerful species uh, that run our ecosystems. Not all species contribute equally, so we want to start with the ones that are most important, the ones that other species depend on. Uh, so we're really talking about two groups. Uh, the the uh, Pollinators, mostly our native bees, that are going to sustain those flowering plants that, that are the first trophic level in so much of our landscape. 
and the animals that move energy from plants to other animals. You know, plants are, are capturing the energy from the sun and through photosynthesis, creating essentially all the food that runs life on earth. But most vertebrates anyway, don't eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants. That's something that typ typically insects and the insects that transfer more energy from plants to any other, uh, uh, more energy than any other type of animal to other plant eaters um, are caterpillars. So caterpillars are the most important group of organisms taking the energy that plants create and delivering it to other, other animals. If we create landscapes that don't have caterpillars, most of the energy remains locked up in plants and that is a dead end for a food web. Let's use my friend, the Carolina chickadee as an example. Um, we have a lot of data on chickadees. They, of course, are seed eaters during the winter. At least 50% of their diet is seed during the winter. But when they're reproducing, their babies can't eat seeds. And that's true for most of the birds that are out there. So they switch to insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will feed their young exclusively on caterpillars. And they're not exceptions. 96% of our birds, our terrestrial birds, are rearing their young on insects. And most of those insects are caterpillars. So there's something special about caterpillars. Um, we'll talk about what that is in a second, but here's a little bit of data that, that uh, supports what I just said. This is um, a study by Ashley Kennedy, one of my uh, previous uh, PhD students, who did a citizen science project where she put out a call to bird photographers and said, please take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they are carrying food to the nest and send me the pictures. And they did from all over the country. She got thousands of pictures, identified what was in the beaks of those birds, and then reconstructed the nestling diet of 20 of the common bird families that we have in North America. And that's what you're looking at right here. The green bars are the percentage of those nestling diets that were caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families in North America, caterpillars dominate the diet. So again, imagine what would happen if we took caterpillars out of the system. Most of our terrestrial birds would not be able to reproduce. What is special about caterpillars? Well, a number of things. Uh, first of all, they're soft. So think of this guy as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. Thin wrapper is exoskeleton, it's cuticle, it's undigestible. Uh, and that's good because birds, birds don't want a lot of cuticle. Uh, and because they're soft, you can stuff the caterpillar down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring it. Have you ever watched a parent bird where they're young? Uh, they're pretty rough. Their beak is like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but uh, do you want to chase 200 aphids or eat one caterpillar? They are nutritious, very high in fat, very high in protein, very low percentage of chitin compared to most other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. A lot of a beetle is undigestible, uh, and they've got a lot of sharp edges. And it turns out that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now I mentioned carotenoids, uh, not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate, birds are vertebrates and vertebrates cannot make their own carotenoids. We have to get them from plants and we have to get them from plants because they are essential components of our diets. And that's why uh, my wife, Cindy says, I have to eat my carrots to get my, my beta carotene. I have to eat my tomatoes to get my lycopene, my whatever that is to get my lutein. And she makes sure I eat all of those things because they stimulate my immune system. And I cannot think of a better time to have a strong immune system. They're also antioxidants. They run around our body, protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about things like this, this male prothonotary warbler who is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutines. And he takes those lutines, makes pigments out of them, puts them in his feathers, and the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. But where are the birds getting their carotenoids uh, from during the breeding season? From the prey items that they bring to the nest. And as you can see, carotenoid level is not equal uh, across bird prey items. Caterpillars have far more carotenoids than other types of, of bird prey. Orthopteroids, the third bar here, the crickets and grasshoppers and katydids have the next highest level. Here are the adult uh, caterpillars here, the moths and the butterflies themselves. Not that many carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves anymore. What's there is left over from when they were a caterpillar. Here is the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. 
Does this influence prey choice when birds are feeding their young? Well, Ashley did another study with bluebirds. She put uh, GoPro cameras on the rooftops of bluebird houses, and those cameras took a picture once every second. Uh, the object was to get a picture of the bluebirds as they flew in with prey to, to the nest. Um, and she had a lot of GoPro cameras and a lot of bluebird nests, and she did it for three years. So she had well over a million pictures to go through. But out of the million pictures, she had 7,628 observations that were good enough she could identify what the prey item was. And we got this very nice relationship here. The, the prey brought back more than anything else were caterpillars, and they've got the highest level of carotenoids, followed by those orthopteroids with the next highest, uh, and then everybody else is nestled down here. Uh, so it really does suggest that carotenoid content could be one of the factors that birds are using when they, they select their prey. Uh, but what it really says is that caterpillars are, are, are important to birds. They may not be optional parts of bird, bird diets. It looks like they are essential parts of bird diets. So let's just say birds need caterpillars. How many do they need? Is one or two enough? Well, let's go back to, to chickadees. Um, no, one or two is not enough. Take 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars just to get the birds to the point where they leave the nest. And then after they leave the nest, uh, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days, but they're flying all around. So nobody's been able to count them. And if you want chickadees breeding in your yard and you do, because if they're not breeding in your yard, where are they breeding? That's what we have is yards these days. Um, you gotta have all those caterpillars in your yard because the chickadees forage about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we landscape in a way that does not have all these insects in our yards, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is directly tied to bird decline. We went to the uh, data set that Rosenberg et all used to find out we've lost uh, 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided those birds, terrestrial birds, into the, the birds that require insects at some part of their life history, usually when they're breeding, and the birds that don't require insects, the finches and the doves that can, can uh, reproduce on seeds themselves. They actually gained a, a little bit, but the birds that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species over the last 50 years. This doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that there is an important relationship there. So I'm saying we need caterpillars in our landscapes if we want to continue to have other things like birds and all the other things that eat those caterpillars, uh, which means now we have a new goal for landscaping. We've got a landscape for caterpillars. Just the opposite of what we've done in the past. We've, we've landscaped in a way that made sure there were no insects at all. Everybody knows insects are all bad. All right, we're gonna turn that around. We're gonna add caterpillars to the landscapes. And we do that by adding the plants that make them. Simple enough, except there is a catch. Most plants don't make a lot of caterpillars. So we have to add the ones that do. And the monarch butterfly, of course, ex uh, you know, is a perfect example of host plant specialization. We have to be careful about the plants we add to our landscapes because caterpillars are really fussy about what they eat. You can have your crepe myrtle and your calorie pear and your boxwood and your burning bush and all the other Asian ornamentals we love. Uh, and you're not gonna have a single monarch uh, produced by those plants because the only thing you certainly know this, the only thing they're gonna develop on is milkweeds. And monarchs are not, are, they're not exceptions. Most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists because plants have made them that way. Plants don't wanna be eaten. They wanna capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they have loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And if you don't believe me, uh, next spring, next summer, go out and eat a plant, see if you like it. You're not gonna like it. All those plants are, are loaded with defenses. And that's why it's green out there. It's not because there's no insects out there that wanna eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. There is a reason it is hard to get our kids to eat vegetables. They inherently know that they're toxic. That's my little joke. Um, well, this is not a joke. We do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those, those chemical defenses? It's where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants can only eat the particular plants they have developed specialized adaptations for in order to avoid all those chemical defenses and physical defenses and other things as well. So they develop uh, enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize their exposure to those compounds. 
It takes a long period of evolutionary exposure to those plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. And that's why our insects are so poor at eating plants from other continents. They haven't been exposed to them nearly long enough. Well, every single insect lineage out there is protecting itself in a unique way and insects can adapt to all of them. So they pick one or two and get really good at, at that particular plant lineage. That's where the specialization comes in. So all I'm really trying to say here is that plant choice matters. And if we're trying to reconstruct food webs in any given place, we have to choose the plants that will allow us to do that. Because a lot of plants won't allow us to do that. And I'm going to give you three examples of um, how well this works when we do choose plants care carefully. I'm going to start with uh, our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. I'm sitting in this window right now. Uh, this is what it looked like when we moved in. We've got 10 acres of a farm that was, was split up. Um, it is a very old farm and farmed for uh, more than 300 years, believe it or not. The soil was exhausted. Um, the last thing they did was to uh, mow it for hay. But, you know, we heavily invaded with Asian ornamentals here, multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and porcelain berry and autumn olive and privet and everything else. And so when you mow for hay, you're really mowing rootstocks of all of those guys and you call it hay. So when we built the house, of course, they stopped the mowing and what came back were all of those plants. This is what the entire 10 acres looked like. That's Cindy getting ready to clear the 10 acres. So if you have a bad invasive species problem and you, you're discouraged saying it's impossible, it is not impossible. Cindy has done it. Uh, it is a lot of work. There is no, no doubt about it. Um, what was I doing when Cindy was working so hard? Well, I was telling her she was doing a great job. Uh, but I also was putting the plants back and I did it selfishly. I've got a little hobby of taking pictures of, of uh, caterpillars I've never seen before. And this was one, the Canadian outlet I said, gee, can I attract the Canadian outlet to our house? Uh, well, to do that, that's what the adult looks like just like a leaf. I had to plant meadow row. It's a specialist on meadow row. We didn't have any meadow row. There was no meadow row anywhere around us. Used to be here hundreds of years ago, I am sure, but um, long gone with all the farming. So I got some meadow row seeds from somebody, planted them. They grew really well, but I didn't know how long, if ever, the Canadian outlet would, would take to find my meadow row. I mean, maybe they had to come from Canada. I don't know. So I didn't check my meadow row uh, for a while. Um, it was about a month and a half before I walked out and just happened to walk past my, my little meadow root patch and it was practically defoliated by Canadian outlets. They had found it right away. No idea where they came from. Um, but now I've got a thriving population of, me of meadow root and Canadian outlets. So I've added two species to the property. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. Uh, has nothing to do with goldenrod. That's a misnomer. It actually is a specialist on this plant, Biden's aristosa. Some people call it ditch daisy. I did know where there was some ditch daisy uh, nearby, about 14 miles away uh, in some uh, power line cut. So I got the seeds and planted them. Our house grew really well. Uh, it took about a year for the moth to find our, our uh, ditch daisy, uh, but they did. Now I've got a thriving population of both of those. So now, now we've added four species to the property. I wanted hackberry emperor because it's a butterfly that ought to be here. But it eats hackberry, of course, and we didn't have any hackberry, so I, I planted hackberry. I had to wait longer here. I had to wait three, four years before the butterflies actually showed up. Uh, but another big success, I walked by one of my hackberries this past June, and on a single branch, there were nine hackberry emperor butterfly larvae. I did not plant goldenrod. It came in on its own, and along with it came many of the, the caterpillars that specialize on, on goldenrod, like the brown hooded owlet, the arcidra flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaganothus, the goldenrod gall moth. This is one that hasn't come, the goldenrod flower moth. I don't know why. I don't know why I haven't been able to get this guy. That's what the, the caterpillars look like. So this is anticipation. Excuse me, this is like waiting for the, the ketchup to come out of the bottle, waiting for this caterpillar to come to my, my yard. One of these days I'm going to go out and find it and that'll be a great day. Planted Virginia creeper, believe it or not. Yes, look, it's a beautiful plant. It can climb our trees without pulling them down, doesn't strangle them, uh, and it supports uh, particularly a lot of sphinx moths. The beautiful things like the Pandora sphinx and it's, it's a really exquisite adult. The lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, and many other caterpillars on Virginia creeper. It's a great plant. I wanted zebra swallowtail, or at least I wanted to see if we could get it. Uh, I was stretching it here because we're, we are north of, of the northern limit of 
uh, zebra swallowtails. It's a pawpaw specialist. We didn't have any pawpaws, so we, we planted pawpaws. Uh, and then we had to wait. We waited nine years before the, cat of, the uh, swallowtails actually showed up, but they did show up. The, the no, closest population I know of is 26 miles south of us, yet they still found our, our pawpaws. In the meantime, we got the pawpaw sphinx. I didn't know there was a pawpaw sphinx and lots of pawpaws. One of the double tooth prominent, just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. Well, it's a specialist on elms. So I planted American elm. It came right away. Evening primrose moth. It's a beautiful moth. I like beauty like anybody else. So I planted evening primrose and the moth comes and spends its, its the day it's stuffed with its head in the flowers. It's very cute. And I planted lots of oaks. Now these are just examples of the plant lineages we put in into our property. But I'm gonna focus on oaks for a while because they're such important trees. This is the Bedford Oak in uh, Bedford, New York. It's a large white oak and people argue about whether it is 400 years old or 500 years old. Um, but you know, a lot of people think that your oak has to be enormous before it can contribute to your, your property. I hear people say all the time, I'm not gonna plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. Well, unless you die the very next year, uh, you will, you can enjoy what your oak is doing for you. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns or as two foot bare root whips. Uh, and right away, they started attracting the moths that have, are created by caterpillars that run the food webs that everything in my yard depends on. Like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, the orange headed epicolema, the red washed wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the Bleak heterocampa, the red line panapoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more caterpillars have come to my oaks, including the Bernie Meme caterpillar. This is a new one, got this just the other day. And they come right away. Uh, this is the crocus geometer standing on the ground eating a pin oak that has just poked its head above the, the leaves. Um, so you don't have to wait hundreds of years for your oaks to start to contribute to your food web. They will contribute immediately. This is a picture of our yard. Uh, I took it a few years ago from the same place I took that original picture. I'm still sitting in this this window right here. Look, we've got lawn. We're very traditional here, but I just want to I'm going to show you that we put some plants back. Uh, I'm still adding plant lineages that I'm sure were here in the old days. Um, and every time I do, new species of moths come to my my property. So four years ago, I, I made it a goal to start taking pictures of all the moths that I could find uh, on our ten acres. I am up to 1,030 species of, of moths uh, and I'm, I'm not done because I still, I got, well, I got over 200 last year. So um, there's still a lot more out there. That's just moths, not butterflies. Now we own 10 acres. Pennsylvania is, is 2.4 million acres. By the way, we live in Pennsylvania. So on one 240 thousandths of the landmass of Pennsylvania, we've got 38% of all the moss species that occur in the entire state. And because each one of those is a potential bird food, we've recorded 59 species of birds that have bred on our property, not flown over, but, but bred here, which is 40% of all the terrestrial birds that breed in, in Pennsylvania. In other words, it works. You put the plants back, it works. You know, this fall, we saw this headline, uh, World Wildlife Fund says that the earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. And I'm thinking, not at our house. Uh, you know, I, I would easily wager that we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds and it didn't take that long to do it. And we did it because we put the plants back. It just wasn't that hard. So that's, that's meant to be encouraging. We can turn these terrible headlines around if we all just do it. But you may be thinking, well, you got 10 acres and I live in suburbia on a much smaller piece of land. Will it work there? Uh, that's a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri, where the major invasive species is bush honeysuckle. So when they got their property, which is 0. 0.6 acres, a little bit over a half acre, so about 18 times less property than what Cindy and I have. They got rid of all their bush honeysuckle, planted a bunch of native plants, and then put in a feature, uh, water feature they call a bubbler. And then they sat back and started to count the birds that were using their, their property. 149 species of birds so far. 
35 warbler species. Just to put that in perspective, we've only recorded eight warbler species at our house. So does it work on smaller properties? Absolutely. But can it work in, in urban yards? Well, let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. You people know Chicago, and I mean in Chicago because right over this wall is O'Hare Airport, one of the runways. Right over here is, is Kennedy Expressway. Pam has one-tenth of an acre. That's three times smaller than the average lot side in, in North America. Well, she did the same thing. She got rid of her invasive species. She planted 60 species of native plants, put in a water feature, and she sat back and started to count her, her birds. And she's up to, uh, it's wrong, it's 117 species of birds. She sent me an email the other day. She got a great horned owl the other day. 117 species of birds have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, you can go to Chicago and check it out at Pam's house. What about city centers though? 82% of us live in cities these days. Well, in 2014, I was looking at this plant, Asclepias tuberosa, people call it butterfly weed. But that reminds me that we have a serious marketing issue with our native plants. We call them weeds and wonder why people don't plant them. So we're not gonna call this butterfly weed anymore. We're gonna call it Monarch's Delight. So I'm looking at Mon Monarch's Delight in 2014. And the first thing I saw were two species of leafcutter bee, megachylid bee. Um, and I know they're leafcutter bees because they carry their pollen on their tummy, not on their, their legs. Uh, well, leafcutter bees have very specific requirements. Uh, not only do they need pollen and nectar, but they need soft leaves because they cut the edges out of those leaves uh, and leave these little, little semicircles. Um, this is a red bud, by the way, perfect for, for leafcutter bees. Then they roll up those, those uh, leaves into tubes, stuff them full of pollen and lay an egg in it. And then they, they, these are three different uh, eggs laid in three different tubes stuffed into a crack or a crevice. This is from, from Heather Holm. Um, so that's how, how leafcutter bees reproduce. But those soft leaves are, are essential. Um, well, there was a red bud growing right next to the monarch's delight. And that explains why leafcutter bees were there. But it probably explains why there were bumblebees there as well. Remember, bumblebees overwinter as queens. There are no workers. So in the spring, the queen has to do all the work. She's got to start the colony her, herself, do all the foraging. So you need a lot of, of abundant forage early in the spring. And redbud supplies exactly that so that the queen can get her colony going. Well, there were bumblebees there. So obviously, that worked. Then I saw a monarch. Now remember, this is 2014 and 2013. I went the entire year without seeing a single monarch. That was the low point of the monarch population in the East. Only 3.6% of the monarchs left compared to 1976. I actually saw two monarchs this day, foraging on monarch's delight. Um, so I was encouraged, and it was June. It was very early for the monarchs to get that uh, as far north as, as uh, where I was. Um, so I was encouraged, you know, maybe the monarchs can, can come back. Why were they there? Well, there was monarch's delight, but there was another species of milkweed there as well. I guess it's purple milkweed. They had forage, but they also had their host plant. They could reproduce. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan. And this is the strip of nature that we're talking about here. This is, this is an elevated railroad, if you haven't been there, that was converted to a tourist destination, a bunch of native plants planted in this strip. Um, along the entire High Line, it's about a mile now, I think. But, uh, you know, Manhattan, construction 30 feet above the taxis, not a lot of nature there. Plenty of people, more than a million people visit the High Line every single year. It's a, it's a wonderful attraction in uh, Manhattan. This is Rick Dark. He was after me to go to the High Line to see all the beautiful plants for a while. I'm not much of a city boy, so I dragged my feet. But, uh, you know, I was afraid I was going to go to the Highland, see a bunch of pretty plants, but nothing would be using them. And to me, that's depressing. But I was totally wrong. Somebody has done a, a study of the bees on the Highline. Now they're up to 30 species of bees that are, that are using the Highline in the middle of Manhattan. So I'm convinced that if thoughtful native planters can bring life back to the middle of Manhattan, we can do that anywhere. But there's four things we need to think about if we're going to be successful. The first one is we have to shrink the area we have in lawn. We've got a lot of lawn. We've got over 40 million acres of, of lawn. And that's an old statistic at this point. So uh, I'm sure it's higher than that. And of course, the way we maintain our lawn, it's, it's a dead space. We, we have it because it is a status symbol. It tells our neighbors that we are, we are well-to-do. We are good citizens. We know how to manicure and, and keep bad things out. Um, so status symbols are important, but let's cut, cut the area of lawn in half. We'll plant 
half of it. We're still going to keep the other half manicured. We can still send that that social signal that we are we are good neighbors. But with the other half, we can create a new national park that'll be 20 million acres in size. And this is what I'm calling homegrown national park because we're going to do it at home. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks plus Yellowstone plus Yosemite plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. And up this park, still less than 20 million acres. And there are a lot of benefits to creating or recreating uh, at least parts of nature right where we live. It will allow us to develop a personal relationship with the natural world. If we never had one, we can develop it for the first time. If we had one as a child but have lost it, we can redevelop it and we can do it at our own time and our own pace. Um, we can avoid crowds. You don't have to actually go to a national park. You know, when you do go there, there are millions of people there. It's free. Nobody's going to charge you. It's never closed, no matter what pandemic comes down the road. No travel hassles. And we get to experience the natural world alone. I think that's essential to developing that relationship that I'm talking about here, particularly for our kids. Richard Liu says our kids are suffering from nature deficit disorder. So, you know, we're trying, we, we, we get 30 kids, put them on a bus with a teacher, they drive for an hour and walk around a, a natural area. And the teacher tells them not to touch anything. And then they get back in the bus and they go home. I'm sure that's better than nothing, but it's really an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If nature is where they live, they can go outside alone, no parental supervision, see if they survive and develop that relationship. Maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii on a very small patch of nature. And it's not all that natural. It's lawn and a hedge, uh, about 10 square feet, but there are a no lizards there. Uh, and she has figured out how you hunt lizards. This is how you do it. You get on the ground, you cover yourself with sticks and leaves so the lizards don't see you coming. And then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. No smiling. This is serious, serious business here. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard, you catch it, you put it in an aquarium and you've got that personal relationship. Now, I don't think Zoe's gonna be, be sneaking on the ground catching lizards the rest of her life, but I guarantee she will remember catching lizards the rest of her life. She's got that connection now, uh, which is, is so important because Zoe and her peers are going to be the future stewards of the earth. If they don't know what they're stewarding, if they don't know why they need to steward it, they're going to be lousy stewards. Uh, if you want to do more than hunt lizards, get this book, Nature Play at Home uh, from Nancy uh, Stranisti. Dozens of examples of how to expose your kids to the natural world. And by the way, if you want to join Homegrown National Park, we now have uh, uh, a website, homegrownnationalpark.org. You can get yourself on the map. You go to the website, you put in your, your data, which is where you live and the amount of area that... Um, that you're, you're either committed to uh, preserving, you already have preserved or, or uh, whatever you're gonna work on. Uh, and then your little, your little piece of the map will, will light up. And the object is to, is to watch everybody and the US get on board here. Watch the map light, light up, watch connectivity build. Um, you know, Kathy said where the goal is 20 million acres and it 20 million acres to start with. I mean, the U.S. is a lot bigger than that. If we all do it, it's going to be a lot more successful than that. Somebody said, you know, are you selling our data? No, we're not selling your data. As a matter of fact, it's free. We're not selling anything. So just a fun social media event. All right, we're going to, we're going to shrink the lawn. What plants are we going to put back where the lawn was? Uh, well, some of those plants have to be what I call keystone species, keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is. You've got the Roman arch and the keystone is the stone in the middle of that arch. And if you take that stone out, the arch falls down. Keystone plants are so important that if you take them out of your local food web, the food web collapses. It turns out that there's just 5% of our native plants making about 75% of that caterpillar food that drives those, those food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food which means about 85% of our native plants um, aren't making that, that much caterpillar food. They're doing other things, but these plants all aren't created equal. So the, the question no longer is simply, are natives better than non-natives? On average, they certainly are, but there are a lot of natives that are so well protected, they're not contributing a whole lot to food webs either. Uh, so the question really is, do we want ecologically productive plants in our landscape or 
benign plants doing nothing or ecologically destructive plants, those, those invasive species, those calorie pears that are becoming biological pollution everywhere. Serious biological pollution, ecologically castrating the, the ecosystems around us. I get an email once or twice a year from somebody who says, don't I know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba, actually grew in North America. It's an Asian plant, of course. Grew in North America 7 million years ago. That makes them native, and that means we can plant them, and everything will be great. Um, yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in, seven, in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today, but I'm not going to argue about it because that's not our metric anymore. I don't care if ginkgos grew on the moon 7 million years ago. They produce zero species of caterpillars here today. And that's, that's our metric here. So they grow, they're there, they're pretty, but they're not supporting the life around us. What is, well, the, the number one keystone plant genus in all of North America, or at least in 84% in of the counties of North America is Quercus, is oaks. Now your wonderful burr oaks. Uh, in the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars, 557 species of bird food. Nationwide, over 900 species supported by oaks. There is no other plant genus that comes close to that. And this is this is how keystone plants are contributing to the diversity in, in our yard. Now, so far, I've, I've taken pictures of 1,030 moss species in, in my yard. I haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. We'll, we'll get there. Out of that 1,030, 906 have known host plants. So there's still, there's a, over 100, we don't know what they eat. Of the 906, 267 species use oaks. We have 69 genera of native woody plants on our property. Only one of them is oaks, is Quercus. And we got hundreds of genera of herbaceous plants. So oaks represent less than 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity, but they're supporting almost 30% of our moss species diversity. That's the role of a keystone plant. So imagine what would happen to the diversity of, of life in our yard if we took the oaks out. How are you gonna find out what your keystone plants are? Well, you go to Native Plant Finder, National Wildlife Federation website, uh, and you put in your zip code and the ranked list of both woody and herbaceous plants for your county will, will pop up. Ranked in terms of the number of species of caterpillars they're recorded as supporting. Uh, so oaks are gonna be number one um, in, in uh, Illinois. Notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows, native birches, native maples. You can go to the nursery, you can say, well, I wanna buy a cherry and they're gonna sell you an, an ornamental cherry from Asia. I wanna buy a willow. They'll sell you a weeping willow from, from the Middle East. I wanna buy a birch. They'll sell you the, the uh, you know, weeping birch from, uh, from Europe or the Japanese maple. You gotta specify that you want a native member of these native genera even though there are non-native native members of that, the, those genera. Because if you get one of the non-natives, it's going to reduce caterpillar use by 65%. We've done that experiment. And that's not the goal. These are uh, often the top uh, ranked herbaceous plants. Goldenrod is always way up there. There are many asters. We've got several uh, genera of asters now, very high. Native sunflowers, very high. And remember, these are also the top um, supporters of our specialist bees. With just those three genera, uh, you can support over 40 species of, of bees in your yard. And if you don't have those three genera, you're gonna, that's 40 species that won't be there. Okay, we're gonna shrink the lawn. We're gonna put in keystone plants and then we're going to kill all the insects that come with our security lights. And that of course is not the goal. Um, a lot of data, particularly from Europe, is suggesting that light pollution is one of the major factors causing insect declines, at least in the temperate zone. Uh, we kill our insects uh, through exhaustion. They collide with, with the light. They get incinerated. They die from dehydration. The bat comes and picks them off. Uh, bright lights blind a lot of our nocturnal insects, and it keeps them from doing what they ought to be doing. So to me, this is actually really good news because if this is a major cause of insect de declines, it is also one of the easiest to reverse. Just turn off your lights. That's a flick of a switch. I can't think of anything easier. But I know what you're gonna say. I can't turn off my lights because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on your security lights so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're gonna learn is that the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take the white light out of your security uh, system and put in a yellow bulb, a yellow LED bulb. 
uh, is the least attractive to nocturnal insects. If we took out our, our uh, white lights that we have on all over the place and replaced them with yellow LED lights overnight, we could, in the summertime, we could save billions of insects in a single night uh, and probably billions of dollars because LED lights are a lot more efficient. Seems like a no brainer. Okay, we're going to reduce the lawn. We're gonna put in keystone plants. We're gonna turn off our lights. We're gonna have lots of insects around. Then we're gonna invite Mosquito Joe to come and kill them all. No matter what we do, we always seem to be happy killing insects. And of course, this Mosquito Joe's out there to, to uh, kill all those pesky mosquitoes, most of which, you know, Aedes aegypti, Asian tiger mosquito, they're invasive species themselves. And I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to save those invasive species, but fogging our mosquitoes First of all, doesn't work, which is why Mosquito Joe has to come back and back and back. Only kills about 10% of the adult mosquitoes. You need to kill 90% of the adult mosquitoes to get control. Um, so this is an expensive way to fail. The way you really kill, oh, by the way, come back here. Mosquito Joe will tell you um, that this is a natural product, so it's okay. It is, Pyrethroids. Pyrethroid, it comes from plants but cyanide is also a natural product. Nicotine is a natural product. I mean, doesn't mean it's not, not gonna hurt you. Um, he'll also say it only kills mosquitoes, not true. Kills all the insects that, that it comes in contact with. So how do we really wanna control our mosquitoes? Um, this uh, is a much more targeted approach that I'd love to see used uh, in, a, in mass so we can see if it really, really works. You get a bucket, you put in, you fill it with water, put in straw or hay and let it ferment for a couple of days and it becomes irresistible to ovipositing mosquitoes. They lay their eggs in that butt bucket. A couple of days those eggs hatch, then you throw in a mosquito dunk you get at the hardware store. This is Bacillus thuringiensis, um, very targeted. It's, it's a, a bacterium that kills aquatic diptera. So the mosquito larvae nibble on it, they die, and it kills only in the mosquito larvae. If you get a, a dragonfly larva in there, it's not going to hurt it. If the bird drinks, it's not going to hurt it. Um, so extremely targeted, uh, and it kills mosquitoes in the larval stage. That's how you control mosquitoes. The fourth thing we need to do is to create landscapes that allow caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. Some of them, like the polyphemus moth, can complete their development on the tree. So here's the caterpillar. It eats the leaves. Uh, it, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from the branch. Then it emerges as an adult, and it does it all over again. And I wish everything did that, but most species don't. 480 of those species, 94%, drop from the tree, wiggle their way below the soil, the soil is loose enough and they pupate underground uh, and then they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that is that is under the tree and the problem is there is no leaf litter under the tree and the ground is usually so compacted and mowed and trampled on and everything else that um, very hard for those those uh, soil pupating larvae to get down there and survive. So this becomes, the way we landscape becomes a giant ecological trap. We call in the, the moths and we put the appropriate trees in. They, uh, they lay their eggs, caterpillars develop, they drop down and they die. And the next generation is smaller and the generation after that is, is gone. I am convinced that this sterile type of landscaping is a major cause of, of insect declines. And of course the cement landscape is um, less of a viable option for our, our caterpillars. And I'm not trying to discourage the use of trees in cities. I'm trying to discourage the profligate use of, of uh, cement as a default landscape. That's just laziness. And we know, you know, it destroys watersheds. We know it's not a good idea. This is what most people do. You have a big tree, you put it in a lawn, caterpillars drop down. Nobody's measured the survivorship of caterpillars in a situation like this, but I guarantee it's higher in a situation like this. We've got a tree, then a layered landscape, maybe a dogwood over here, then a native azalea and ferns and ground cover. Caterpillars drop down to a safe site. The ground is loose. They can easily get underground or spin their cocoon in the leaf litter there and survivorship is high. This is where you do your spring ephemeral gardening. Another safe site. And, and this, by the way, is, is one of the major ways we can shrink lawn. You put big beds around your trees. So you create those safe sites for the caterpillars. Nobody's gonna squish them or mow them or walk on them here. And we get to put a lot more plants in the landscape. This is where you can use your, your uh, ground covers, your wild ginger, your foam flower, your mayapples, your native Pakistan, or lots of ground covers that, that you can use. 
ferns. I mean, this is this is a hotel, but that's a safe site. The caterpillars could survive there. Um, something I learned from my another graduate student, Desiree Narango, is, is uh, she's gotten her PhD and is left at this point, but she did great work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. And from her work, we've learned there is room for compromise in our plant choice. She compared the sustainability of chick chickadee populations in landscapes that were um, dominated by native plants, not 100%, but dominated, versus landscapes dominated by introduced uh, Asian ornamentals. And when those landscapes were dominated by introduced plants, they produced 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, we reduced the amount of chickadee food by 75%. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. There were nest boxes up in each, each, uh, at each site, but the chickadees would come and look around and say, well, there's not enough, not enough food here. We're not even gonna try. If they did try, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive. If they did survive, those nests produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and maturation was delayed by 1.5 days. If you put all that together in a population growth model, as a function of the percentage of woody non-native plants in the landscape, uh, from none to 100%, this is what you get. This dotted line is replacement rate. This is the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. If you, if you reproduce at this rate, that's a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you have a growing population. But if you make fewer babies than adults um, are, are, are dying, you've got a shrinking population. Right here is where those lines overlap, right around 30% non-native woody uh, plant biomass in your yard, which means if you, you've got to have at least 70% of your, your woody plant biomass to be productive natives to sustain breeding, breeding birds. But it also means this is the area of compromise. You can have anything that's not invasive. You can have your ginkgo. You can have your, your, uh, your crepe myrtle, your boxwoods, as long as it's not going to escape and, and pollute everything around you. Um, it's okay if it doesn't dominate your landscape, if it's not more than 30% of, of the landscape. Uh, and that's good news to me because uh, we love our non-native plants. And if I said you can't have any, very few people would be, would be listening. It is not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It is the absence of native plants. And that's what makes invasive species so bad. They force the native plants out. Can we use native plants in formal landscapes? Of course we can. Somebody sent me this picture from uh, North Carolina where they're replacing uh, all of these plants with native plants. And when they finish, they're gonna send me another picture. It's a very formal garden. This is Joe Pye, of course. Notice I didn't call it Joe Pye weed. It's not a weed. Um, and it, 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 it illustrates that formality is a function of, excuse me, of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. And I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a pollinator garden into a traditional suburban lot like this without offending anybody? Of course we can. Let's put a little fence around it. That's beautiful. It's servicing a number of species of bees. It's not very big, but if everybody did it, we'd have a lot more bee forage in our yards. You know, when we say that pollinators, we need pollinators for agriculture, that it bothers me because, yeah, for some of our agriculture, we need, we need pollinators. But um, what if you don't live next to a farm? And you say, well, then I don't need any pollinators. Yes, you do. 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants require pollinators. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. Not an option. So where do we need pollinators? Everywhere. Everywhere you want plants, which means in our suburban lots as well. How about this, Drew Latham design, um, you know, three or four times the size of our, our little fenced one. Imagine the amount of life that is here versus the amount of life that is, that is here. It's a no brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can, and more and more are doing it. Uh, Minnesota, you know that, that this, uh, they've got a cost sharing program that encourage homeowners to, to replace some or all of their lawn with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. They pay you to do that. Um, there's an island in Florida that's paying its residents to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in their front yards. This is the way the Invasive Species Act should have been written, with carrots rather than sticks. If you've got an, uh, not an invasive, 
the endangered species. If you've got an endangered species on your property, uh, we'll pay you to take care of it rather than punish you by fining you or something. That's the way we should do it. Missouri, they had a, uh, St. Louis had a, a uh, bounty on calorie pairs. You got a, if you brought in a, I guess if you documented, you took down a calorie pair, certainly one of our most invasive ornamentals. They give you a free tree replacement. Fayetteville, Arkansas is doing the same thing now. Um, so that's, that works. Even, even public utilities like uh, San Antonio Water System, give me people $100 coupons to remove uh, water thirsty plants and put in appropriate natives that are water efficient. Buffalo's doing that. Buffalo, New York uh, has nothing to do with water. They just want to get more natives into the landscape and they're paying people to do that. And of course we have the lawn replacement programs of the far west, particularly California, where if you take out uh, the thirsty grass and put in uh, xeric plantings, you get the $2 per square foot rebate. Good deal. Okay, we made, in my opinion, we made three missteps in the early years of conservation. Early years meaning last century. The first one is that we've assumed that nature is important, but not essential. That's the misstep, thinking that it's not essential. If it's important, but you know, we like it, we have, have to have it around, we want it around. But if, if, if resources are short, then nature always loses because it's not essential. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out and there was this wall size poster there, which, which to me epitomizes what a lot of people, including our, our top conservation biologists uh, are motivated by. We wanna save nature so that future generations can enjoy it. I mean, that was Teddy Roosevelt's motivation. I'm gonna create national parks so that future generations can enjoy them. But to me that suggests nature is there just for our entertainment. And it is much more than that. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. It's a little bit more urgent. Second misstep, we've assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. We talked about this. If we do that, uh, if we only do conservation where there's not a lot of humans, we're, we're you know, condemning it to, to failure because those areas are not big enough. They're too small and too isolated from each other to sustain the species we need. David Quammen has this excellent analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. It's 71 rug fragments and none of them are functioning as a Persian rug. That's what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that language because it suggests there are places on planet earth with no ecological significance. Not so, every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including all of our human dominated spaces. So we have to glue our rug back together again. We got to put plants back into these no man land white spaces here. And if we focus on those keystone plants, we can create habitat that is so good, plants and animals can live there. They won't just be biological carters to allow them to move back and forth to, to good habitat. We're going to create good habitat right where we are. In other words, we're going to start sharing our spaces with nature. Our third misstep was to leave earth stewardship to just a few specialists, a few people who cared ecologists, conservation biologists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility for every human being in the planet. And I have no idea why, because every human being in the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystem. So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility for good Earth stewardship? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder once said, the Western settler mindset is I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is I have obligations. You're not, you're not born with these mindsets, you're taught them. We've been excellent at teaching this one. We've been terrible at teaching this one. We all have an obligation to earth stewardship. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you really can save it where you live. And I really like this approach because it empowers each one of us. You now it's so easy to feel absolutely powerless today. The, the earth's problems are so huge. What difference can a single person make? Well, next spring, this spring, plant an oak, plant a, a keystone species, put in a pollinator garden, reduce your lawn, take out your invasive species. That's one person doing that. One person has created a functional ecosystem right where you live. Uh, that becomes, means everybody is now an important cog in the future wheel of, of conservation. And it shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problem. You will go crazy if you do that. 
Just worry about your piece of the earth that you can influence. If you own property, that's it's a no brainer right there. If you don't own property, volunteer, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help your local park. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is gonna determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. And I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Doug. This is Mary. And Mary. one of the bad things about doing this online is we don't have the ability to hear everybody's applause. Oh, that's okay. Everybody muted, but I'm sure that uh, if and everyone is as, as energized as I am, then uh, they're giving you standing ovations right now. But we do have a lot of wonderful questions in the Q&A, so let's uh, dive right in, fasten your seatbelts. First question, look into your crystal ball. What will be the future of residential landscaping? <laughs> well, um, okay, my crystal ball says it's going to change because what we're doing right now, I mean, it has put a smack in the middle of the, the sixth grade extinction and we can't afford to be there. Uh, so before that extinction is completed, we have to do exactly what I just just told you. But you know, I've got I've got more than a 10 year perspective on it. And I do see it changing. It is very tough to change culture, but I see it changing. Uh, there's a, there was a paper just a couple of weeks ago talking about the the national shortage of native plants. So many people want them that, that it's, you know, demand is exceeding uh, supply. That's good news because that will that, you know, if the demand is there, then people will start to grow what we need. And that means that that attitudes are changing. These terrible headlines about losing 3 billion birds and, and, and uh, insect declines and all the other things we hear about have upset people. And when they hear that they can actually do something about it and they can do it right where they live, they get excited about it. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking we're going to get to a threshold where it becomes so commonplace that people will start to do it just because their neighbors are doing it. Uh, it it's been shown that that peer pressure is is the strongest uh, component in terms of attitude change. So when we get to that threshold, things will change very rapidly. We're not there yet. We're not there yet, but we're moving in the right direction. Well, that's great. Uh, next question. Is there data that shows it is cost effective to convert small public grass filled drainage ditch to prairie. The only way I see change on public property is by showing the cost savings. In other words, costs of replacement and maintenance versus mowing cost. Right. Years ago, I saw Jack Pizzo give a seminar where he, he has worked out the costs of, uh, this is the cost of hiring him and he's not cheap to convert, uh, you know, some area of, of uh, property. It's usually corporate landscapes or something. He says, well, you know, it's going to cost this much in the beginning, but you're going to stop mowing. Uh, you're going to pay me every year for maintaining it. But I think it was in 10 years, they broke even. And after that, they actually made money. And that's with a fairly expensive um, regime. So uh, that's the only one where I've actually seen the numbers worked out. Uh, so, so ditches, yeah, you know, if you, if you stop, if you stop mowing, you're going to save money from the mower. We did a, we did a, I, I wasn't involved, but in Delaware, um, Sue Barton actually did a study with, with Del Dot. This was several years ago, uh, where she convinced them to stop mowing uh, big portions of Route 95 and some other uh, Delaware highways. And she put in a lot of native plants. And then she took surveys of um, what people thought of the different plantings when they drove by. It was a five-year project. The, one of the biggest obstacles she had, though, was from the mowers themselves who were afraid they were going to lose their job. So she had to guarantee that nobody would, would lose their job. And you could do that if you reduce mowing by saying, well, we'd only do it through attrition. You know, if somebody retires, you just don't hire another person. And that makes it a little bit easier because nobody wants to lose their, their job. But um, it, is, it is a no-brainer to, to, to have, when we have grass and all the places we used to have good native plants that we call weeds, we've lost a tremendous amount of biodiversity. So get, the, get those plants back and stop mowing it. No-brainer. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next two questions are related, so I'm going to ask them both at the same time. The first is native plant versus cultivars of natives. 
I have heard not to purchase cultivars of natives as they are not the most nutritious of health. Is that true? And the second question is, what are the differences between natives, nativars, cultivars, varieties, and how they attract caterpillars? Okay, let's start with the second question. Uh, you know, a nativar is just, a, it's a cultivar of a native plant. And if you actually try to use that in official publication, they'll make you change it. The horticulture industry hates that word. Um, so what's a cultivar? It is a genetic variant of a straight species. So when you make a cultivar of a native species, it's a genetic variant of that straight species. Uh, and many cultivars are actually natural variants that somebody found in nature. Uh, so for example, uh, red maple, Acer rubrum October glory. Uh, it's, I believe that was a natural variant. It was a really red colored maple that somebody found in the woods and they brought it in and cloned it and put a name on it. They called it October glory. So nature was the one that created that genetic variant. Um, are cultivars ecologically as functional as straight species? And the answer to that, there's, there's actually very little data on it. We, we did a study uh, with Mount Cuba Center and Annie White has done a, done a study with a number of plants up in, in Vermont. Um, but it's really not much. We looked at six traits of woody plants that are commonly uh, converted through, through uh, either you know, selection or, or somebody found it. Take a tall plant and make it sure you take a green leaf and make it red or purple, make it variegated, um, increase fall berry size, introduce disease resistance. Those were the types of traits we looked at it. And then in a common garden experiment over three years, we measured insect use. Uh, and the only trait that, that consistently reduced insect use was taking a green leaf and making it red or purple because that uh, introduced um, anthocyanins to the leaves, which are feeding deterrents. The other traits, you know, sometimes it affected them, other times it, it didn't. So, um, and I was surprised about that. I thought the cultivars would, would hurt insect use more often than it did. Uh, so, so actually that's, that's pretty good news. The, uh, the news from flowers is not as good. Uh, occasionally, uh, a cultivar actually increases nectar loads and you get more visitation. But um, when you start fooling with flower traits, when you make petals bigger, when you make an echinacea look like a zinnia, um, when you create a double flower, uh, you're, you're typically reducing nectar and pollen load or changing the specialized relationship between the specialist bees and uh, that particular flower species. In which case, at least the specialist bees are gonna, gonna suffer. And that's pretty much what, what Annie has found so far. But um, again, not that much research. So I would say the answer is it depends on what the cultivar trait is. Uh, but let me just throw in something that I worry about. And that is that most cultivars are, are propagated clonally so that there's zero genetic variability. Which means if we plant only cultivars, we're putting zero genetic variability out there in, in nature. And we, you know, genetic variability is, is what evolution works on. That's what natural selection uses to, um, to save our plants when we have global warming and other crazy things. And all the, all the selective pressures we're putting on, on our plants these days, they need as much genetic variability as they can, they can get. So I would love to see nurseries carry straight species all the time along with the cultivar. So if somebody says, okay, I got to have a cultivar. All right. But you ought to have the option of getting the straight species. And you know what? That's changing as well. Not as fast as, as it could. But um, remember the, the, the nursery trade has, you, were, you told them for a century that you only wanted plants as decorations and they better be pretty or you're not going to buy them. And that's what fuels that, that, that uh, most of the cultivar trade. So it's going to take him a while to figure out that no, we're actually going to buy some plants for function now. Great answer. Um, the next question. I've improved my landscape so that I now get lots of caterpillars, but the birds or wasps seem to eat them all. I now rear some caterpillars in mesh cages. What is your opinion on that practice? On the practice? Well, you're right. The, <laughs> that's what the birds are eating. Um, it's, I tell people don't bother to look for caterpillars in, in May or June because the birds have, have you know, they get them first. Uh, the time to look for them is end of July, early August when the birds are switching to more, um, more fruits and berries. Um, there are pluses and minuses to, to rearing things. 
I think it's an excellent educational tool. So a lot of people are, are rearing monarchs and um, it's how a lot of kids are being exposed to nature for the first time. It's, it's a really powerful hook. Uh, so I see that totally as, as, as positive, but there are a number of situations where, where you know, domestic rearing of species introduces diseases. Uh, and uh, you know, if you then release them and, and the disease gets out there, I don't know how often that actually happens, but people people worry about it. I don't think enough people are rearing enough caterpillars to to really make a difference. The other things we talked about, you know, mosquito spraying and lights, and everything are, are killing far more more uh, moths and butterflies than than any any rearing we're doing. So I guess I'm pretty pretty liberal on this. If you if it really brings you pleasure, and it often does, I mean, it's okay. It's okay with me. <laughs> Okay, um, from Pat, I have a corner picked out in my yard for a project this spring that gets lots of afternoon and evening sun, but no morning sun. What flowering and non-flowering plants would you suggest? Uh, you know, the, the native hydrangea, hydrangea arborescence, straight species, this is one where you, you do not want to get the cultivar Annabelle. And that's what they'll probably try to sell you because Annabelle is a double flower. It's, it's uh, bracts have been, the reproductive parts of the flower have been turned into bracts. And so it looks like a big showy uh, hydrangea. Um, it's a native plant, but then, you know, it's ruined the pollination, uh, pollinator attributes of it. But that one will bloom in uh, shade that's, you know, almost continuous shade. So that's a, a really good bloomer when you have uh, low light. Any of your, your, um, spring ephemeral, ephemerals do well in that that type of a lighting situation or even less less light. Um, many of our plants will do fine in a situation like that even though they're flowering plants they just won't flower as much they won't make as much fruit uh, but it doesn't mean they can't be there um, occupying space in a productive way so uh, our, our uh, you know our hollies our native hollies Ilex verticillata um, winterberry People plant that so they get the pretty red berries, but you know what? It's a it's a superior pollinator plant. It's got tiny little white flowers. Nobody even notices them, but when it's in bloom, you look at all of the the tiny little native bees that are that are on there. Same thing with inkberry. Um, so there are you know there are a lot of op options. So Marina thinks a lot of people prefer lawn because it's so easy to maintain. Do you have suggestions on how to replace lawn with native plantings that will require as little maintenance as traditional lawn? Yeah, that's an issue. I mean, it's easy to sit on a, on a lawnmower, particularly if you have a big, a big property. So around me, you know, people have, you know, three or four acres of lawn. Sitting on that lawnmower for three or four acres takes a while. That's not a small commitment, but compared to managing it in a responsible way with a lot of plantings, um, it is something to think about. Most people, the statistics say most people don't do any gardening. They simply hire somebody. And that includes mowing your lawn. They hire a lawn service. So uh, one option is to simply hire uh, what doesn't exist in most places now. And that's what I would call ecological landscapers who know what plants should be there, who can get them established. That's where the work is. It's getting them established. Uh, once they're established, the maintenance really drops off. But it's not zero maintenance. Um, and then these people would come and, and take care of it for you. So getting it established is where most of the work is. Uh, then maintenance really does does drop off. And at that point, I would I would challenge the notion that that uh, taking care of a lawn is is actually easier. All right, uh, we have a heavily wooded area with 100 year old oaks. I've never seen any of those caterpillars. Is there a trick to finding them? Yeah, there are there are tricks. First of all, you know, remember I planted my oaks from acorns. So for uh, a number of years, they have been had branches low enough that I could walk right up to them and look at them. Your hundred year oaks, I'll bet those branches are pretty tall, and it's it's hard to get up there and, and take a look at them. Uh, but the caterpillars don't want to be found. All those birds are out there looking for them. So they've got all kinds of of, of uh, ways of being cryptic. They look like Ed, the edges of damaged leaves. They roll the leaf up and hide inside. Many caterpillars uh, during the day will crawl off the leaf and some even crawl off the tree 
and then go back up at night and they feed at night. So a really good way to, to, to uh, find caterpillars is to go out with a flashlight at, at night. Uh, and, and they're, they're, you know, they're easy to find at night when during the day they, they're, they're hiding. If you, excuse me, if you can see them, that means a bird can see them too. You always want to look on the underside of the leaf as opposed to the top. If they're on the top of the leaf, they probably taste bad. So they're advertising their bad taste by, by exposing themselves. Um, but you're developing what we call a search image where, where you learn what they look like and you just kind of scan the leaves and you see something that in your brain says, ah, that's what I'm looking for. But until you develop that search image, they, they're really cryptic. They're hard to find. Okay. Um, I've heard that some wasps are starting to feed their young with the brown marmorated stink bug. Is this true? And how can you attract these wasps to help control this insect? I've never seen that. I've never seen that. I have seen bluebirds feed their young with brown marmorated stink bugs which amazes me because I had a brown marmorated stink bug fly in my mouth and it does not taste good. It actually burned. Uh, so I couldn't imagine they were feeding them to their young. But now, I, you know, wasps usually feed their young caterpillar. They, they like the soft things that they can um, chop up. I won't say it's not happening. I just have, have never seen it. So I can't tell you which wasps are, are doing it. I'm sorry, I was muted. How does climate change <laughs> impact the native plants? And what are the potential concerns in the future? Well, climate, you know, climate change, we're really talking about increased climate variability. So you get these wild temperature swings and wild swings in rainfall, you know, from, from drought to, you know, nine inch deluges, just extreme weather events, which is hard on plants and hard on the animals that, that uh, are using those plants. Some people are talking about what we call assisted migration, where you actually move southern plants farther north so that they're, because plants, you know, the, the, the temperatures are changing faster than plants are actually moving. Um, I don't really support that because you do get that, that those extreme weather events. We're still getting polar vortex, vort Vortices, vortices. Uh, you get those, you know, big dips in the in the temperature. So if you brought that southern plant up, even though the average temperature is a little higher than it used to be, uh, it's still going to be cold enough to to kill it, um, even if it's only one or two days a, a winter. Um, plants are definitely uh, being affected. You see the plants that uh, uh, there's different zones of plants that occur on a mountain. So uh, it's easy to see those zones change and the, the zones that are farther down the mountain are moving up. Uh, many of our alpine plants are going higher in the mountain than they used to because of, of climate change. Uh, so people talk about, well, they're going to get to the top of the mountain, then there's no place to go, then they will disappear. Um, and, you know, it's logical, hasn't happened yet, but it very well could happen. Climate change, there's not much good to say about climate change. So, uh, it's a tough one uh, to deal with, but you know what? What will help is putting more plants back into the ground. That includes all of your prairie plants of the Midwest. They are sequestering almost as much carbon as a forest with their giant root systems and all the carbon they pump into the soil. So um, when you replace your lawn with prairie plants uh, or take any of those you know, bigger areas and, and restore those, those prairies, may not be as diverse as it used to be, but you are sequestering an awful lot of carbon and that at least can make us feel good. Okay, this will have to be our last question. In my neighborhood, the city has shunned the ideas of oaks due to sewer damage. I find this funny since we are called Oak Forest. Can you please address the actual impact oaks have in suburbs? Uh, lots less than a quarter acre. Personally, I love oak trees. Uh, well, I hear all the time about oaks lifting up sidewalks and wrecking the streets, but I've never heard about sewer damage. I, I you know, I, I can't imagine which tree would not damage sewer lines if it runs right underneath where the tree is. Um, I, I uh, recently found out that 
we have a lot more species of small oaks than I ever thought we did. Two pages worth. I think I counted up 22 species of oaks that are either shrubs, they're either small trees, shrubs, or even ground covers. If we used more of those, now most of those are not in the trade, but they could be um, because it's easy to, to, you know, you get an acorn, you, you make an oak. Um, we could get a lot more oaks into the landscape without all of them being giants. So that would be my response to that. Let's let's focus on dwarf, dwarf chinkapin oak or, or many of these other very uh, small oaks that are not going to wreck the sewer lines. It doesn't mean no oaks. And by the way, uh, there are about 600 species of oaks worldwide, and a third of them are now endangered. I think you may be muted again. Yeah, that's the that's the last question. Kathy, would you like to take over? <laughs> She's Kathy, definitely, are you muted? She's muted. <laughs> I sure would, Mary. Thank you so much, Doug. That was terrific. I'm completely re-motivated or more motivated than before or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Great. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. All right. Well, good luck with, with SAG Moraine, and I'm sure we'll see you down the road. I hope so. We'll be promoting right. homegrown. Thank you. Great. It's a great. Yeah, get on the map. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Okay, Mary, do you have any questions for us? Yes, there are quite a few questions here for SAG Moraine. Um, the first question is, the founding of an organiz organization is no small task. What motivated you to start SAG Moraine? My husband, Jim, and I were always avid gardeners, uh, birders, um, nature lovers, conservationists. We always tried to plant a lot of plants for bees and butterflies, and we didn't use chemicals. and. But we were noticing as the years went on from the, because I was doing this from the time that I was, you know, my early twenties, five years ago. Um, but we noticed that um, as the as the years went on and the decades went on, regardless of, of our plantings, we were seeing less and less life, less bees, less butterflies, less moths. You look in the streetlights, you don't see them flying around the streetlights anymore. We would, we were rarely seeing caterpillars. We were, the lightning bugs were, were greatly reduced. Um, the little roly poly bugs, you never saw them anymore, which by the way, are very endangered and wonderful cleanup bugs that keep our environment clean. And, and so we weren't seeing these things despite being gardeners. And then we heard a talk by Doug Tallamy and it all made sense. We were putting in plants that had pretty flowers that, that hit, gave pollen for our pollinators, but we weren't putting in the host plants for our butterflies and moths and the, and the specialized plants for the specialized bees. So we weren't thinking native, we were just thinking flowers. And once we started converting more over to native, all of a sudden life reappeared on the property. And so we just thought if we as gardeners didn't know what was going on, how about people that are not gardeners but want to do something that makes a difference, that's right, even if it's just planting the right type of tree or putting a little pollinator garden in, we, we thought if we don't know this, there's probably a whole heck of a lot of people out there that don't know this and would love to know this and would care to know this. Why did you name your organization SAG Moraine? Well, being in the Southwest suburbs of Chicago, we have um, a very rich natural history related back to the glacial age. And we have a lot of landmarks that are that refer to SAG and a lot of landmarks and that use the word moraine. And this, the SAG is the waterways that are formed by glaciers and the moraine is the 
um, the buildup of debris in front of the glacier that was pushed by the glacier. So this is a, the, the topography of this area is very key to that glacier age and our soil here is very rich and full of nutrients because of that rich glacial history. When will there, how, I'm sorry, how often will there be member meetings and when is the next one? We're gonna have member meetings once per month. Um, the second Wednesday of every month is the plan for right now. Uh, we're gonna be meeting on February 10th at 7 p.m. for our first member meeting. They'll all be online for right now. As time goes on, we'll see how we adjust that. Okay. This sounds like a lot of work. Are you promoting that everybody convert their property into all native plants? Absolutely not. That's the main message that we want to get out. I, I, we feel that the native plant movement in some ways has gotten a bad name because people have gotten the idea that they need to create a meadow on their property. And in the southwest suburbs, we don't necessarily live in the type of places where that would be widely acceptable. Um, so we want people to know that just planting an eight by eight pollinator garden, a native shrub and a native tree will do wonders. We realize that most people don't want to, it's not a hobby to them. It is a hobby to me. It's not a hobby to them. They don't want to spend their weekends out working in the yard, but they do want to make choices that will help rather than hurt our environment. Can you please speak to the importance of master gardener extension programs as great resources for local planting and pest information? Oh, absolutely. We have, I mean, University of Illinois Extension has great programs great information on, and then in fact, that one um, uh, University of Illinois is, is behind that Illinois Monarch project that we wanna get involved with. So absolutely check out your local extension. There's tons of resources there and some resources from the U of I extension that we've also shared on our website. Where can I find more information on keystone plants in our area, in uh, the Sag Moraine area? Well, like Doug said, and he was um, partly responsible in making it, the National Wildlife Federation Native Plant Finder website will show you what the keystone species are for your zip code. So type in your zip code and they'll show you in order how, how beneficial different species of plants are to our local ecosystem. And how can I find landscapers who are knowledgeable about native plants? That is a very good idea. That is a very good question. And that's something that we need to work on and are working on. Um, if you come to our first members meeting, Kelsey from Possibility Place is gonna be talking about that, talking about the um, trying to get more landscapers that the, the landscapers are going to do what people want. So if people want native plants, they'll learn it. If our nurseries, if people want native plants, the nurseries will start selling them. Once the movement gets, once more and more people start asking for it, they'll learn it. And Kelsey is going to be addressing that at our members meeting of his reaching out and the, the landscapers that he's, that he has worked with. And that, and that does that do know that. Your website lists some of the cities in your in the area that you service. What if I don't live in your area? Can I be involved remotely? Absolutely. So much of what we do is remote and, and so much of the even post COVID, if there is such a thing, um, even most of the even a lot of the stuff that we're going to do post COVID will continue to be remote because I think that for members meetings and things like that, some people, you know, if you can, if you have kids or you can sit in the, in your comfortable chair at home and come to a members meeting versus sitting in a library in a folding chair, I think people would probably prefer that. We will be adding more social things when we get together, it'll be more for hikes or birding events or going out for pizza or whatever it is, going to have a picnic and, um, but absolutely. And 
you know, we may not be as special, depending on where you are, we may not be as specialized in the native plants of your area, but we would sure be happy to help you and do the research with you too. So the next question is, uh, you may have just answered, but uh, what are the, what are event plans for Sagmarine during COVID when we can't really interact? So unfortunately it's going to have to be online for now, but, and, and with our plant sale and our Zoom meetings and our webinars and, and social media, but I am, we have projects planned for this summer that we want to get involved with. So we would, we would love members and volunteers to to help us with these projects and um like i said when when the time is right and hopefully it will be this year we can also start doing some hikes and socializing and actually have some some fun too it can't be all work <laughs> okay uh this is the last question so far uh if anyone has any additional questions please put them in the q a uh, but here we go. You mentioned Facebook. Are you on Instagram? We are on Instagram as well. And um, also, if you want to connect with other uh, native plant enthusiasts or just learn from each other and, and share pictures of your gardens or questions, also check out our Facebook group. Okay, Kathy, I don't see any other questions. Last call. Okay, well, thank you very much everybody for coming tonight. Um, again, please consider becoming a member and for sure consider planting native plants. Our environment needs it. Thank you. <laughs>